footage appears to show that January the 6th was not an attempted insurrection, and yet the legacy media and Hillary continue to refer to Trump as the new Hitler, and that he will end democracy. But what's the real threat to democracy? Is it a return to Trump, or is it the fact that the Democrats have betrayed the principles that they continually espouse in the pursuit of endless authoritarianism? <laughs> Hello there, you Awakening Wonders. Thanks for joining us on our voyage to truth and freedom, which often begins with a great wave of propaganda and you feel like you're drowning in it, like you've fallen off a surfboard and you're being dragged down to the bottom of the oceans. And occasionally you get to put your head above water and get a breath of clear, free truth. Remember when January the 6th happened, it was presented as the worst kind of insurrection that could ever have happened. There's no question at this point that the event has been used to legitimize anti-protest laws, anti-Trump rhetoric, to legitimize surveillance and censorship. So what has gone on with January the 6th and what's going on with all of the hysterical language around Trump and fascism? Is Trump the new Hitler? Is Trump a threat to democracy? Or is the real threat to democracy the abandonment of the principle principles upon which republics or democracies, whatever you want to call them, are founded, i.e. the ability to be individually free, the ability to pursue happiness, stuff that's in your constitution. So let's have a look at that in some detail. Firstly, let's look at the debunking of January the 6th as an attempted insurrection and the numerous times that Trump is being compared to, equated to and likened to Adolf Hitler. Just into our newsroom, thousands of hours of Capitol video footage from the January 6th riots are being uploaded to a public website as we speak, newly elected House Speaker Mike Johnson announced his plans to release them today as part of a campaign promise he made. Like an insurrection, to me, I don't know how I understand the word, is there's like a plan in place to like, right, you're going to be Speaker of the House, you're going to be in charge of the Pentagon. They don't look like they're doing that. They look like they're wandering around six flags. There's no question that democracy is under threat. There's no question that democracy has changed. There's no question that people are tired of globalism and are looking for ways to thwart the advances of various transcendent and globalist entities, whether they're corporate, or NGOs or regulatory bodies like the WHO, IMF or WEF, who people sense are impeding on their lives for very legitimate reasons which we've covered elsewhere on our channel. People are looking for a different type of politics. So people that talk about America first or France first or the Netherlands first or Britain first, that kind of language is appealing, I guess, just by its nature. That kind of nationalism historically has been connected with racism. There's no question about that. But what I think is interesting now is the attempt to entirely conflate this emergent new populism with racism, and not only racism, but in the case of Hitler, Hitler was beyond racism. We're talking about genocide and global warmongering. I think the real problem is that there's no viable alternative to nationalism. If you are opposed to globalism, where are you supposed to look? Because the centralist, authoritarian, neoliberal left are fully on board with the globalist project, and a hell of a lot of people don't like it. People would get legitimately elected. Mm -hmm. And then they would try to do away with elections and do away with opposition and do away with a free press. Weird though, isn't it? Because even just on those few seconds there, Hillary Clinton has said, do away with free press, Hunter Biden laptop, Russia Gate. You could have a different conversation with Hillary Clinton where you could say, what went on with the steel dossier that you guys funded? How is that not propaganda? What about the censorship of the Hunter Biden laptop? What about the fact that you don't want free elections? That the elections are being managed, that Donald Trump as a political opponent is being hounded and harangued? I know they are saying because he's legitimately and genuinely a criminal, but certainly you could take a perspective that that's the attempt to imprison a political opponent. What is broadly interesting is an inability and unwillingness to countenance their own failings and to have transparent and open discourse about the failings of their party, of their trajectory, of the unpopularity of their policies. And you could see it in countries where, well, Hitler was duly elected. That's right. Right? Let me think of someone off the top of my head who I'd like to commit to Hitler. Trump is telling us yes. what he intends yes. to right. do. To listen yes. to Take that. him at his word. Yes. Those are the, that is the, the imagery language of, used of, by, by yes. Adolf Hitler. There are so many stunning parallels. <laughs> It's not stunning parallels. What I would say is that what was bad about Hitler was genocide and warmongering. Warmongering? Bloody hell, look at what was going on at the moment. Look at the amount of influence and power that is exerted by the military industrial complex. And please God, no one's interested in genocide. Please God. To what Hitler was doing in the early 30s, once again, I'm not saying Trump is going to slaughter six million Jews. Oh, thanks. It's very nice of you. So I firmly believe, knowing Donald Trump, 
that if you said to Donald Trump, Mr. Trump, in order to become Putin, in order to stay in office forever, in order to loot this country, you have to do X, he is capable of doing wherever your mind can take you for X. A thousand percent. I think what we're witnessing is propaganda. What's peculiar is Trump is accused of hysteria and hyperbole, but that hysteria and hyperbole is easily matched by his detractors. Absolutely. Michael Cohen said it. You know, he is an autocrat. In his mind, he wants to be president. I want to stop using the autocrat. I want to start using the word fascist. Yeah, he's a fascist. And the tendencies, many, many tendencies like Adolf Hitler. Yeah. I said it. Throw me off the air. Okay. The definition of fascism that most interests me is when you have corporations, legacy media and the state in such coalescence, in such powerful alignment that there is no way to penetrate the public discourse. There's no way to enter the public sphere. There's no way to oppose the trajectory of power. I think that kind of fascism has broadly been achieved already. Let's have a look at this article by Public. When Donald Trump became president, Democrats predicted the worst. Trump's shocking victory, his ascension to the presidency, is a sickening event in the history of the United States and liberal democracy, David Remnick wrote in The New Yorker the day after the Election. Trump, Remnick said, was an authoritarian who disdained civil liberties and whose election was surely the way fascism can begin. That kind of accusation would be more valuable if Julian Assange was not in prison, if we were not seeing further movements to endless surveillance, the continuation of the aspect of the Patriot Act that allows surveillance of American citizens. All these things are still happening if there wasn't the perpetuation of the forever wars. Whether you like Trump or not, he is a response to political and economic conditions that have been caused by decades of neoliberalism that don't provide meaningful alternatives. Trump had little respect for the First Amendment, Democrats claim. He attacked freedom of speech and of the press, striking at our fundamental rights. On top of this, liberal media outlets alleged Trump used his office for personal gain and weaponized the justice system for his own benefit. After January the 6th, 2021, the liberals who had been skeptical about anti-Trump hysteria became convinced that the hysterics had been right all along. But Friday's release of the first tranche of January's 6th tapes can confirmed that Trump's actions paled in comparison to the steps Democrats have taken to defeat him and his supporters. The tapes corroborate public's previous reporting and show that the Democrat-driven narrative of an insurrection was highly misleading. Democrats used this narrative to demonize tens of millions of voters, to justify their censorship efforts, and to weaponize the justice system against their political enemies. They've continually spoken about MAGA extremism. Hillary Clinton's even said about debugging and decoding Trump extremists. And to refer to those events, of January the 6th as an attempt at insurrection is hysterical and it seems to me that like many crises in recent years was exploited to legitimise legislation to advance further control and condemnation of an opponent and the movement affiliated with that opponent. That seems more reasonable than that was an attempt to take over the country and run it differently in baseball caps sort of while smiling, sort of grinning nervously. It's true that the tapes show rioters forcefully entering the capital and some scenes on the tape are not peaceful. It's also true that Trump's rhetoric has at times been inflammatory and illiberal. But inflammatory rhetoric has been present on both sides. If you're continually talking about Hitler, that's about the most incendiary thing you can say about anyone, isn't it? But what the tapes do not show is a coup attempt. Rather, they show many scenes that contradict this narrative, like January Sixers walking calmly down the hallway, Capitol Police appearing completely unfazed by these supposed insurrectionists, and Capitol Police giving the trespassers handshakes. Yeah, because they're broadly speaking, pro-police, aren't they? That's the kind of one might assume their general stance. So it seems like there's not been an objective appraisal of those events. There's been a highly biased exploitation of those events, which is in keeping with what we understand about 9-11. Like, you know, in this moment, there's not question the origins and how 9-11 was carried out, but what was 9-11 used to facilitate? In this conversation, there's not question the origins of the pandemic, but let's look at how the pandemic was used. Was it used to legitimise regulation, to bring about policies that otherwise would have been impossible to generate profits? Did it make things economically worse for the vast majority of people while improving the economic conditions of the elite? There's so many clear examples now of how crises of various kinds are exploited to legitimise the agenda of the powerful that it seems sort of almost redundant to keep pointing it out. Despite the evidence that law enforcement at best permitted this coup to take place and at worst facilitated it, January 6th judges have handed down extremely harsh sentences. They sentenced one defendant to 22 years in prison despite the the fact that he wasn't even in Washington, D.C. on January the 6th. You'd think that would be a pretty good alibi. Were you in Washington, D.C. on January 6th? I was not.
22 years. Oh no, Jesus Christ. What's more, the January 6th tapes show scenes that are far less violent than Black Lives Matter riots, which were investigated and prosecuted with much greater lenience, even in cases of arson and assault. We've been able to show many times on our channel how both January 6th protesters and Black Lives Matter protesters were subject to the exploitation of the same surveillance laws, which should be illegal were it not for manipulation of particular clauses that Section 702 permits. But there's no question that these protests movements have been used differently. In our country, about 11 or 12 years ago, there were a bunch of riots and they prosecuted the people that participated in that riot super fast. They expedited all of the cases because anything that seems like a threat to the system is often met with a response that shows the ability of authority to crush dissent. Above all, the newly released tapes demonstrate that the Democratic Party's claims to be fighting for democracy and staving off authoritarianism are a sham and that it's the Democrats who have in their persecution of Trump and his followers done more to undermine democracy than Trump ever threatened to do. Elites in the Democratic Party and in the mainstream media, through their efforts to subdue a populist backlash, have eroded First Amendment rights and have politicised the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Department of Justice. What a complex world it is. What a corrupt establishment we live in. You know who you can trust? It's Sticker Mule. We can't bring you this groundbreaking content without our fantastic partners. And who have we got as partners this week? Sticker Mule. Imagine this being you. Imagine having this experience. Oh, that is, look at that. The satisfaction of ripping that thread to get some Sticker Mule stickers in a limited edition sticker pack. There are six stunning designs, including this little dream boat. Look, look at him. And they're all made with Sticker Mule's magic touch. Now, Sticker Mule has 10,000 of these packs. That's right. 10,000! We keep getting this deal ready to deliver to your address. How much? How much would you pay? A dollar? Five dollars? A hundred dollar he does? Nothing! Absolutely free! Just go to stickermule.com forward slash Russell, fill out the form, get these stickers, stick them all over your car, stick them wherever you want, stick them on your body. I sometimes put them on a shirt. Sticker Mule. Sticker Mule is one of the things in life that is simple and satisfying. Everything else might be corrupt and difficult, but not Sticker Mule, man. They're reliable. Sticker Mule. Let's get on with the show. Democrats became everything they once said they feared in Trump. Censorial, totalitarian and corrupt. Their years-long clampdown on dissent and criminalisation of political opposition was a systematic attack on liberal democracy. Worse, they became everything that liberals during the 20th century warned Americans about. The Twitter files, the Missouri v Biden case, and the Facebook files have exposed the lengths to which Democrats went to quash opposition and prevent citizens from exercising the right to protected speech. At the same time as the federal government has pushed for censorship, the FBI under Biden has increasingly become a domestic spying agency, turning its efforts against regular Americans. When whistleblowers step forward to push back against the Bureau's partisan or unethical practices, the FBI retaliates against them. Meanwhile, the Biden's DOJ is inappropriately shielding him and his son from any accountability for their lucrative influence peddling operations. A growing body of evidence suggests that President Biden played a major role in his son's business and that the DOJ is protecting the president from repercussions. This is precisely the type of corruption Democrats warned Trump would bring to the office of the presidency. The Democratic Party and the Biden administration have become precisely what liberals said Trump would be, and they have attacked the foundational principles of our democracy in the name of protecting them. How did this happen? What is exposed is a complete lack of principles and a willingness to avoid Avoid having any set of values that can be applied to yourself in the same way as you would apply them to your opponents. It's clear that even the basic exercise of switching the names Trump for Biden exposes the fact that, exactly as this article points out, there is no clear application of principles that would be applied blindly, the way that justice is supposed to be blind, that it shouldn't matter who you're talking about. If this riot is bad, then that riot is bad. If that surveillance is bad, then all surveillance is bad. If this censorship is a problem, if this usurping of the principles of democracy would be a problem, then you have to be able to apply it universally. If you can't, what you have is just a partisan agenda that is utilised in order to meet certain objectives. And that's plainly what's being observed. The obvious reason for the authoritarian and even totalitarian turn among liberals was the internet in general and social media in particular. Elites since World War II had largely controlled the information that masses received through TV and big newspapers and wire services. That all changed with the rise of the internet. Internet freedom had worked for progressives 
motives until 2016. After Trump's win, Democratic Party leaders refused to accept blame and they redirected criticism towards themselves and their presidential candidate towards the internet. Social media got Trump elected, they argued. Political scientists disagreed, but it didn't matter. Democrats wanted to believe it because it justified their more primal desire to silence their enemies. We needed the government to regulate social media, argued the former intelligence community people, like Rene Diresta, who Democrats put forward in their hunt for the Russian disinformation that supposedly resulted in Trump's election. But beyond the revolt of the public unleashed by social media, liberal elites have found it so easy to demonise Trump supporters because they rarely encounter them in person. The country is deeply divided partly because of what author Bill Bishop called in The Big Sort in 2004. Americans, Bishop explained, are increasingly clustered into areas where everyone around them thinks the way they do. This social transformation goes far beyond red versus blue, leading to extreme polarisation. Wrote Bishop, We have built a country where everyone can choose the neighbours and church and news shows most compatible with his or her lifestyle and beliefs. And we're living with the consequences of this segregation by way of life. Pockets of like-minded citizens have become so ideologically inbred that we don't know, can't understand, and can barely conceive of those people who live just a few miles away. It's extraordinary, actually, that fully immersive technology and the miracle of modern communications seems to have deposited us back in the condition we would have been in hundreds of thousands or at least tens of thousands of years ago, where we live in tribes with cultures that seem unimaginable to a tribe just across the river that might have had a different totemic animal, a different system of worship, a different understanding of reality. It's extraordinary that this imprint has somehow been realised again at what is currently the apex of what's technological logically possible. I think a deeper conclusion that can be drawn from that is generally speaking people need to have as much control over their community and as much authority in their own life as possible. What that suggests is minimum intervention by government, minimum control by global corporations, minimum influence exerted on your individual life and your community life by globalist entities such as the ones I described at the beginning of this video. Because none of those things are possible with the agenda of the Democrat Party, they have to demonise their opponents. But it's ridiculous because you can't vilify in such an extreme way 50% or more of the population without inflating the significance of events like January the 6th without using hyperbolic language like this is like a new form of Nazism and this is like a new form of Hitler which can be exposed as untrue because of the very technology that we're describing. It seems to me this march towards authoritarianism, control of media, ability to censor is undergirded by a strong desire to control media and to control minds that was possible 50 years ago, but is no longer possible without the kind of hysteria that's becoming normalised, as in the clips we showed at the beginning of this video. In 2016, the profound ideological inbreeding among elite segments of the Democratic Party produced what many people have termed Trump derangement syndrome. This was a special combination of outrage, bewilderment and disgust aimed at Trump and his followers, which consumed Democrats in 2016 and has warped their judgement ever since. Democrats conceived of themselves as resisting a great are evil. And this gave them a rationale for censorship, weaponization of government, and the punishing authoritarian culture that now underpins major institutions. The great evil, Trump, and the populist sentiment he represented, needed to be vanquished by any means necessary. As a consequence of this moral righteousness and ideological inbreeding, Democrats began categorizing inconvenient facts and different points of view as disinformation, misinformation, or malinformation. At the heart of the censorship industrial complex is liberals' desire to shape people's thoughts and control the cognitive infrastructure. The narrative Democrats constructed about Trump posing a fascist threat to democracy was also an extension of a dirty campaign trick that originated from Hillary Clinton and her team. In an attempt to weaken support for Trump before the 2016 election, Clinton personally approved the plan to share allegations of Trump's ties to Russia with the press. After the election, Clinton's campaign ramped up the Russian collusion story to excuse her defeat. This narrative has only continued to snowball, with Democrats using the supposedly unique danger Trump posed as a proto-fascist and Mancurian candidate to justify the weaponization of government against his followers. At the same time that Democrats abandoned free speech, they also abandoned a commitment to equal justice under the law, giving Hunter Biden a free pass for federal crimes while celebrating Trump's prosecution for alleged crimes that amount to political speech and activities. 
Please. Under Director Christopher Wray, the FBI has abused its power by inflating domestic violent extremism statistics, using entrapment tactics, and suspending whistleblowers with the full support of liberal legacy media outlets. Progressives who claim to be against harsh punishments for criminals have consistently applauded long draconian sentences for non-violent January the 6th participants. What's been described is monumental hypocrisy. Do you remember, like, that Chelsea Manning was a hero for being a whistleblower, but when them FBI whistleblowers came forward and said, hey, we were manipulating a bit. We don't like the way that January 6th was handled and there were FBI agents in that crowd. These are the sort of stories that the left used to care about. Not anymore. All those ideas have melted away now because partisan interests seem to be directing everything. And those partisan interests seem to be about accumulating authority that can be used to crush opponents. And if that is your modus operandi, then whatever principles you claim to have are irrelevant. All it amounts to is tactics to accrue power. The year 2016 and its aftermath have revealed that whatever principles Democrats and liberals claim to hold, their politics are often reducible to a friend-enemy distinction. This is made evident by the left's sudden rediscovery of its support for free speech in the context of the Israel-Hamas war. Now that the left is experiencing censorship again, journalists and activists say that the kind of censorship they supported for years is actually bad. This about-face can be explained as a friend-enemy calculation in which the left simply wants to purge its enemies and promote its friends with zero consideration for democratic principles. For most of the left, these principles now only exist to be weaponized when convenient, but can otherwise be denigrated and disparaged. Ultimately, the left believed in free speech and opposed the weaponization of government when doing so benefited them and their allies. Once free speech and political dissent threatened the left's authority and influence, it had to be dismantled. The heavy darkness that has overtaken the Democratic Party today is countered by the bright lights of the First Amendment to the US Constitution, the US Supreme Court, and the alliance of true liberals on the right and on the left who support universal rights, not just ones for their friends. Those of us who come from the left view it as a genuine tragedy to see that the party that defended radical levels of free speech become a party of censors, authoritarians, and totalitarians. Last week, Trump suggested that he or another Republican president could use the DOJ to indict his opponents just as Biden's DOJ has done to him. This threat to take revenge may seem to some like a good strategy. After all, some say the right should wield power the same way the left has by rewarding its friends and punishing its enemies. But the Democrats' extremist power politics have robbed the party of any soul it may have once had. The cycle of illiberal revenge tactics that may ensue from their actions make it essential to defend liberal democracy and freedom of speech for all. Whatever the case, the last 20 years make clear that the most sickening moment for the US commitment to liberal democracy came not in the election of Trump, but in the left's betrayal of fundamental liberal principles. In a way, what's provided here is an argument that shows you that what preceded Trump was a decline in democracy, a loss in hope that became very pronounced, I would say, under Barack Obama, where the hope and change that he promised was never delivered. Instead, what was delivered was more war and an economic collapse in 2008 that demonstrated that the affiliation with the financial sector was as strong as it would have been under Cheney or Bush, that the appetite for war was as strong as it would have been. From that moment, on, the election of a populist became a genuine possibility. In the post-Trump era, the authoritarianism, the appetite for censorship, the willingness to weaponize state infrastructure against opponents and the population has shown that all that's left is rhetoric. I think that even the term virtue signaling in itself suggests that the virtue that is displayed is the type of virtue that has no cost, that has no consequence. And when you're willing to support wars, claiming it's for humanitarian reasons, when plainly it benefits the military industrial complex. It seems that there's very little truth. There's very little authenticity. There's very little to hold on to. And then when you have an event like January the 6th, which was rendered as an insurrection that was studied and analyzed and utilized and exploited when massive prison sentences were doled out to people that seem like they were at worst participating in a protest that was at points violent and at best sort of on some kind of day trip to sea world. It shows that the very thing that they're claiming to be afraid of, tyranny, fascism, and dictatorship, is less likely to take the form that we're continually haunted with and offered Mussolini, Stalin, Hitler, but is more likely to be the kind of technocracy where it's assumed that ordinary working people 
are idiots that need to be parented by their political leaders that don't deserve free speech because they can't handle it, that can't discern misinformation and disinformation from truth. So therefore the media has to be censored. That there is a clear appetite to create a tiered society with centralised power where ordinary people's roles and rights are diminished. And for me, that seems like the bigger threat. That seems like the precondition for the rise of populism, for the rise of people that have an ease with discourse, that are able to communicate openly, that are able to refer to a recent past, even if it's through nostalgia and rhetoric that seems more appealing than this advance towards globalism, this advance towards a world that becomes glimpsed in language around pods and vaccine passports and centralised control and 15 minute cities and you will own nothing and the kind of general impression that's emerging in the post-pandemic era of a world where everyone speaks about compassion, speaks about convenience, speaks about safety, all the while amassing power for themselves, using authority in a way that seems a lot like tyranny while speaking the language of kindness and inclusivity. Is Donald Trump the new Hitler? I don't think so. I think that what we're seeing that is comparable to the tyranny of the last century is the emergence of technological dictatorships, globalist technocracies, politicians who speak about kindness while all the while practicing authoritarianism and exploiting crises to bring about further advantages for the elite establishment that they are part of and that I believe caused this problem. But that's just what I think. Why don't you let me know what you think in the comments in the chat below? Remember, we stream every day. Join the conversation. Join the fun. You will love it. It's crazy, wild, free speech. It's absolutely inclusive. It's a joy to be a part of. But more important than any of that, if you can, please stay free. Hey, thanks for watching. If you want to see more uncensored content where free speech can flourish, join our live stream. Click the link right here to watch the next video if you want to or become a member of a growing movement. Download the Rumble app and you'll be informed every time we make a new piece of content. Stay free.